Okay, we're going to get started. Uh, welcome everybody to Gardening Green Expo 2022. The Expo is sponsored by North and South Rivers Watershed Association, the Water Smart Program, and Kennedy's Country Gardens. And I want to give you a few instructions about how to use Zoom, just in case there's anybody new. If you scroll down at the bottom with your mouse, a little toolbar will open up. And there's a thing, if you click on it, it's called chat. And if you have any questions, you can type it into the chat. And then when we get done with the presentation, I'll read the questions. And I'll also be posting some links in there that you might want and some resources. So without any further ado, I'd like to present Blake Dinius. Thank you so much, Laurie. It's great to be here and welcome everyone to tonight's presentation at the Gardening Green Expo. Tonight, we're gonna to be talking about uh, gardening for native, native bees. And uh, this is a topic that's definitely near and dear to my heart. <clears throat> I like to call this presentation Little Bee Big World, uh, but I, I have called it different things in the past. This one is, is more updated than, if you had seen this before, this one is more updated than uh, previous years. So hopefully there's some new information in this presentation that you guys are going to get out of. Uh, I do like to mention that a lot of what I do is surrounds education. So some of the stuff in here, some of the content in here, it, it's all taken from primary literature. It's all taken from research. But if there's anything in here that doesn't really quite jive with something that you may have heard in the past, definitely ask me a question because some of the stuff is summarized. So I do take I try, I try to take, as an extension educator, I take all that information that's floating around in scientific literature, and I do try to distill it down into information that you could then take action with, that you can then put into practice and put it into tools. So that does require, again, a little bit of a summary on my part. So if something is a little different or slightly different than something you might have read, I, like I said, definitely ask me a question. I am more than happy to explain it to you. I'm also more than happy to send you over any studies that I've referenced, and you can definitely see some of the um, citations at the bottom of my slides. So let's talk a little bit uh, about myself, just a, a quick intro if you haven't met me before. My name is Blake Dinius. I work as your extension educator, and this is me in my spare time when I'm not giving these presentations. I like to do a lot of stuff outside. I like hiking, I like birding, I like butterfly watching, I like fishing and camping. But long story short is that I really love the, the nature and nature in New England specifically. I think we live in one of the most beautiful places in the entire country, maybe even the entire world. And just getting out there and seeing it and understanding it is, is really big and really, um, that's a really important part of my life. <clears throat> but before I got into education, I was actually in research. I actually conducted a lot of studies and some of these methods that I helped develop are now being used worldwide. Um, even as far as, you know, as far as Japan and Europe and some of these guidelines. Uh, and uh, the research I conducted, even though we're giving a talk on native bees, the research I primarily was conducting was on honeybees. And for the astute observers and knowledgeable people in the audience, you'll know that honeybees are not native to America. But I still really love honeybees because of just, they're just a fascinating organism to work with. Uh, and this is what a baby bee looks like in these slides. So they look a little bit like a grub. They're not very pretty um, looking, but I do love them. And if you can look at the bottom plate, um, at the, the plate at the bottom, that's uh, 28 uh, larval bees that are, that, or it, it might even be more in this particular study, but we typically used about 28 per plate. And uh, they, they're, yeah, they're just, oh, they were a lot of fun to rear and we would grow them over the course of about 22 days until adulthood. And I would, I would feed them by hand. I would, they required all this feeding and I would pipette little bits of diet that I would prepare myself and give them that food so that they could grow up big and strong. Uh, but now I'm out of research. I just, I primarily, like I said, I just give education. That is my primary role is to teach you all about what's going on in the research world. Because as we know, living in kind of today's world, you don't know what you're getting. You read something online, you read something on Facebook, you really don't know what you're getting. And so my role, I'm, the, I'm specifically hired for, and I have no obligation other than giving you information. And that's what I really love about working this position is that I'm not here for any, like I don't get any donations, whether I'm giving a talk to two people or 102 people, I get paid the same. The only thing that I am required to do is give you factual information without bias. And so there, I, I, I teach people about things that 
I don't necessarily on a personal level agree with it, but I still have to educate them on it. And then things that I do agree with. And this is one of the fun presentations because I really do agree with supporting native bees. But you can really just think of me as a giant bug nerd. I've, I've loved bugs my entire life. I, you know, I just, they're just really so important in my life. And so <clears throat> I, I wanna start off the presentation with this question. And a lot of times people talk about saving the bees, you know, banning neonics. But really, let's start, stop and think about what are we fighting for? And this is such an important question because as I was graduating college and I was get, just getting my feet wet in the bee research world, even I wa wasn't really sure kind of what the definition of a bee is. You know, we grow up with the little mascot of Honey Nut Cheerios and you see these people marching in the street and everyone thinks black and yellow, that must be a bee. But, you know, bees are not really as well defined by just the color scheme that we think they are. In fact, that a lot of people don't realize is that bees actually are wasps. And so sometimes you see online people trying to make the distinction. Oh, I like wasps, but I don't, you know, I like bees, but I don't like wasps. Well, bees are just a subgroup of wasps, kind of in the same way that a dog is a type of mammal. So the bees are a type of wasp. And you can see that based on this study uh, by San et al. In, in, in 2018. And you can see that this is a summary and uh, this, this, this group, if it's a phylogenetic tree, and what you can see is that at the very bottom, it's what I have circled are all of the groups that are wasps. So anything descending down from this group is a wasp. And you can see that bees right here in five different studies have been placed as a subgroup of wasps. And you, know, and you can see all these other groups right next to bees are all wasps. And some of them are ones that we're pretty familiar with, like the cra cra crab ronany. Those are the cicada killers that, that people are afraid, so afraid of in the fall. Again, like these are the cicada killers on the left. So the cicada killers and the, and, the, and the leaf cutter bees, they're all very, very closely related. So what's kind of the defining factor that, that you know, scientists and researchers really use to kind of separate bees from wasps? And what makes them that separate group that are, are, are a subset of wasps is the fact that not the color scheme, but the fact that bees possess these hairs, then not all of them do, but most, a lot of them do possess these hairs that are specialized for collecting pollen. And you can see that they look like feathers, like the feathers on a bird. And wasps don't have these. A lot of the other wasps, they don't have these hairs, just bees do. So bees are basically the vegetarian hairy version of wasps. So I like to think of them like hippie, hippie wasps. They're just, they, you know, they, they don't, they just want to kind of live peacefully, eat, eat vegetarian diets. They only, they only really collect pollen and they're just super hairy and they, they kind of want to save the planet and they can't keep, they want to help everyone. So I do like bees for that reason. But there's so many different kinds of bees. They're not unified by many different characteristics. There's over 20,000 species worldwide, 4,000-ish in North, in North America. And just here in Massachusetts, there are 365 species that are known. There could be more, but, but 365 species are known in Massachusetts. So you can think of that as a different bee species for every day of the year. That is amazing to think of. And this is just kind of some examples about the size range and the, the differences in color scheme. So we all know our, you know, this familiar face, the, the European honeybee or the Western honeybee. You've got the rusty patch bumblebee, which is a, a species of, uh, it's an endangered species. And it's one that we, we definitely want to protect. And that one's been found here in Plymouth County. You've got the European wool carter bee, and that is not a native species of bee, but you can see how different, just how different that works. Still sporting that, that black and yellow color scheme, but in a very different pattern. And you have this one, Osmia lignaria, which I did a little bit of work with. This is the blue orchard bee. It's one of the mason bees, a solitary bee. You got sweat bees. That, these, and this bee, this kind of sweat bee is super small. A lot of people mistake this as a wasp, but you can see, if you look really closely, all of those hairs covering that body that are specialized for collecting pollen. Uh, the Saratina bees, these are called the small carpenter bees. Again, super hairy legs. A lot of people don't really, they hear the name carpenter bee and they get all upset about them because they think they're gonna tunnel into their, their decks and their porches. Well, uh, you know, uh, carpenter bees are, are something that a lot of people will be shocked to learn that carpenter bees don't actually eat wood, but the small carpenter bees are even less threatening because they don't even tunnel into wood on their own. They, they, they use wood that has already been burrowed into and they capitalize on those particular holes. So even though they're called carpenter bees, they're really of no real consequence to your woodwork. 
you've got um you know this it, this is a another kind of sweat bee and you can see it's not that black and yellow color scheme this is it looks a lot like a wasp um and it's just this really cool metallic sweat bee and you can but you can see again the hairs for collecting pollen all over those legs look at all that pollen sticking to those legs and this is just one you know i love this picture it's a great photo and it's just a, a picture of the smallest bee on top of the largest bee again just how different bees can be and most bees are solitary you know about 77 percent of bees are solitary and th that that means that they're not living in those large honeybee hive type of things that we associate with like Winnie the Pooh, for example. There are all these different kinds of bees, mining bees, minor bees, digger bees, carpenter bees, longhorn bees, plaster bees. The plaster bees, by the way, are active right now. You could go outside today and you could see some of these plaster bees flying around and they are a lovely sight because they're not gonna be active all year long. They're only active for a few weeks and then they're kind of, they just kind of go away. Um, they're actually not gone, but they're they're living underground at that point. Mass bees, mason bees, the sweat peas we talked about, leaf cutter bees, and there's just a small fra and then you know a small fraction are social, and then the remaining 13% are parasitic. So they're not solitary or social. They capitalize on living off of other bees, and you can see some of these parasitic bees actually. I've seen them in Miles Standish actually, and some of them support these really crazy colors. That some of them are red, for instance. Imagine seeing a red bee, that, that's a kind of wild looking bee. So what is a solitary bee? What's a kind of solitary bee's life like? Well, there are no workers, there's no soldiers, there's no drones, and there's no queens. It's just a single female bee. And the males, the, get this, the males, they only serve to fertilize the females. So they'll, they'll mate with the females and then they'll fly off and they won't support the kids at all. So these are the men that your mom warned you about, right? Um, they just leave this, this uh, poor female to raise all of the young all on her own but you know what she does a kick butt job at it and she'll she'll be active working her tail off for the next three three weeks ish and then and then her life is over uh the males die too by the way someone asked me that question they said do the males die and i said yes they do and they they, they got a, they, at least they were like oh good thank you at least that happens um, but you can see right now that these bees, these some of these bees, these osmia bees, they should be active right around this time. You can see the early flying population is active around Ma in March, and then the late flying population is active in April. And then that's it. Then the rest of them are going to be lit with the, with these bees live in. These live in hollowed out cavities, hollowed out stems. And so when you look around your property and you see things like maybe raspberry or rose bushes or sumac that have these like small hollowed out stems. When these, when these bees fly around, when they're gone, the only legacy that they leave behind is what's left in those stems. And that those, the, the bees will develop all year long and they'll live in there all year long until the, until the next year, until 2023. 80% of bees though live underground. So sometimes people talk about these stem nesting bees and they put up things like bee hotels to support bees. But most of bees, the majority of bees are not going to utilize those bee hotels. They're going to live underground. And the plaster bees that are active, for instance, you can see on the, on the right photo, they're active right now and they, they're, they live underground. So what about the honeybee? Let's talk about the honeybee for a little bit. Um, I love this photo on the right where it's a, it's a, it's a pig that looks like a, a bee. And it's just a great way to think about honeybees. So honeybees in our country are non-native. So you can think of them a little bit like livestock. Now, the, the honeybee populations and the native bee populations, the, the threats to them might overlap a little bit in terms of different things, but it really, you think of them, they're really two separate stories in both the media and even in science, they try to twist, they, they end up twisting the two together. And I'll, I'll be frank with you, honestly, my lab, when, when the colony collapse disorder came up, that was a threat to honeybees and all this stuff, all this publicity and politics around honeybees, that actually ended up fueling a lot of work on native bees. And that happened with us, even though they're experiencing different things and they're going through different things, like the threats to our native bees are different. Some of them overlap, but many, uh, many of them are different. The threats to, to the native bees are different than the, than the honeybees. And yet they're, it, they're, they're, it's an issue that always gets mixed up. And that's why I want to take special attention to focus on our native bees, because I feel like a large majority of stuff that I see circulating focuses on how 
Uh, B, support our food. They, they talk about how one in every three bites of food comes from a pollinator, it comes from a bee. Well, many of our native pollinators actually are not supporting our food systems, but are supporting our, our natural environment, our natural ecology. Um, some of them support food, but, but many of them don't. When it comes to food, the honeybee is the primary workforce. Um, they, and then things that are harming our native populations are, are not necessarily the same things that are harming a honeybee populations. Very, very different. Um, again, honeybee is not native to America, brought from Europe in the 1600s, primarily thought of as livestock, and like livestock, are replaceable. If we were to lose all of our honeybee hives throughout all the United States, guess what? We could just get more from the rest of the world. What a lot of people don't realize is that honeybee hives, honeybee colonies, might be decreasing in America, in Europe, but they're actually increasing globally. That means there are some countries like, South, like countries in South America and some countries in Asia where the honeybee hives are actually increasing and growing like gangbusters. They are doing just fine. They are doing quite all right. And if we ever ran out of honeybees, we could always get more honeybees from other countries. Um, native bees, not the case. Once our native bees are gone, they're gone for good. They are native to our continent, native to our area, and some place at times native to our regions. And so again, once those native bees are gone, they are gone. Um, and again, I, I do I did add this point is that we're learning more and more that these honeybees are, are, they do have harmful consequences to natural American ecosystems. So they, they, they compete with some of our native bees, they outcompete for pollen, for pollen on some of these native plants. And um, again, you want to really think of, and sometimes you think of being in two schools, like, oh, you either support the honeybees or you support the native bees, but I, I do support both, but for different reasons. We, the honeybees are very, very important for our food. So let's talk about some of these native bees and why I love native bees and why they are important, right? So our native bees, unlike the honeybees, they evolved alongside flowers. And this happened for about you know, 70 to 130 million years ago. That's, that's when we think that honeybee, that, um, sorry, that bees and flowers kind of evolved along together. And now they depend on each other. And I really like bringing up this chart because you can really see um, just kind of these widening areas and they call this the, um, the angiosperm terrestrial revolution, right? So angiosperms, flowering plants, they kind of exploded, right? The species diversity exploded right around the same time that you saw this explosion in diversity amongst of other insects. And hymenoptera right here, you can see this right here, they exploded right down here and coleoptera it seems like it, there's even a greater increase in population in numbers. But we think that the, the, the flower and plants and the insects are tied so closely together but, and it happened right around this, this time period. So, you know, there's different statistics for this, but you know, about 87-ish percent of flowering plants uh, depend on pollinators to reproduce. So things like this lady slipper depends on pollinators in order to reproduce. And flowers kind of adapted this way. We look at flowers as being very, very pretty, very attractive to us. We like the way they look. But all these things that are going on with the flower are not meant for us. They're meant to attract pollinators. So you can think about like the visual aspects of things, the color, the shape of the petals, even the creases, even these folds along the petals, they, ref they reflect light and, re and kind of look a certain way to bees that are really important. If you were to take these petals and smooth them out, almost if you could take a mini iron and smooth that, those petals out, that flower would be less attractive to bees. The way that those petals feel to bees, again, they're all saying things like, eat here, this is where your food is. You know, the way they, they smell. When you're driving along Route 3 and you're hungry and you see these signs saying like Dunkin' Donuts, McDonald's, like Bertucci's, that's exactly what these flowers are doing. You're a bee, you're flying out there. And these flowers are advertising to you, stop here. This is where you need to stop. This is where food is. And I love this. These are, this is the idea of like, what would they call nectar guides? This is trillium. And you can see that pink. That is a, a really pretty ring that goes right in. It, it's like a bullseye that circles exactly where the flower wants the bee to land. Even you can even look at it like the petals almost like pointing towards like being this perfect landing spot for bees. But most, most insects and, and bees, they see in a different color spectrum than, than mammals and birds. 
most bees actually see in the ultraviolet green and blue spectrum. And so when we look at things like this black eyed Susan, you know, they look pretty enough to us and you can see the nectar guides here. You can see that, 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 that dark center would look like a bullseye to bees, but under ultraviolet light, these flowers look drastically different. You can see even more, more contrast, more patterns show up under ultraviolet light that are, and we don't, they, we don't know that these even exist, right? In, in a lot of flowers and until we put them under ultraviolet light, but the bees know they're there. The other thing that's that's actually really really wild is um and this this is some information that came out last year we known about it for a little while but some additional information came out last year about the even just the electrical charge of flowers and bees so bees tend to be positively charged flowers tend to be negatively charged and what what came what we learned last year is that bees can actually detect and remember those electrical charges on flowers. So we, what we used to think is that that charge simply helped bees collect pollen, right? Being positively charged and the flowers being negatively charged, that, that being a, that attractive force, allowing that pollen to stick to the bees hairs. But we actually know now that, that, that those magnetic forces around these flowers actually are a cue. They're a signal to bees as well. And another study, they found that flowers will actually respond to the electrical charges as well. So the bees are remembering electrical charges of flowers and are becoming attracted to them. Flowers are responding to the electrical charge in bees and what, they, what they're doing is they're discharging scent. So when a bee flies around, as that bee kind of gets closer, that flower will, will release a plume of scent in order to kind of blast that bee with even more scent as that bee kind of flies closer to it. So you can see that this relationship is very close. It's a very delicate balance. It's a very fragile uh, relationship that has so many different things that are still yet to be discovered. But like any good relationship, there's always a little bit of fighting, right? You ever meet someone and you say, those people never fight at all. You're like, I, I bet they fight, you know, there, there's some fighting going on, I'm sure. And if there's no fighting, then, then, then there's a problem too. Um, and, and that's the same, the same is true for bees and flowers. They, there is a little bit of uh, fighting, they kind of, a little bit of competition that kind of goes on between them. And the reason behind this is that pollen and nectar, all of these rewards that the bees are after, take a lot of energy to produce. They're not free. The flower can't just give these away for free. There has to be some kind of investment that that flower, that the flower is investing in that bee and saying, here, I'm gonna give you some of this pollen. I'm gonna give you nectar as a reward. Take some of this pollen and you better make sure that that gets to another one of the flowers that is like me. Because if it doesn't, then all of that stuff that I've given you is now wasted. Then, you know, there's tons of stuff, you know, nectar, oils, and pollen. They can't be given out continuously. And so some bees, like honeybees, for instance, they engage in this behavior. It's called flower constancy. And this is what makes them such good uh, pollinators when it comes to crop plants, is that they tend to see one type of flower and go from one flower to the next, to the next, to the next. So even though honeybees are generalist feeders, they feed on many different types of plants. Once they cue in on a certain type of plant, they tend to go to all those plants of the same kind. And so this is an interesting behavior, again, in, in social bees. But there are a number of different ways that flowers and bees have adapted to kind of benefit each other. So flowers will do something like they might have a flower shape that restricts certain bees from coming inside. Maybe the corolla is really narrow and really slender that doesn't allow a big bee, like a big bumblebee to come inside. Or maybe there's a seasonality to it. Like maybe they are only blooming at a certain time of year when they know, again, a lot of solitary bees are active for only three weeks. So maybe these flowers only bloom for about three weeks. Or it could be the type of rewards. There are some flowers known to give uh, rewards that help prevent disease in certain bees or maybe the pollen is more beneficial to the development of certain young. And some flowers are actually toxic to bees. Like they're toxic to certain species of bees, but maybe not others. And the flowers, they became selective, right? They, they adapted these, these, these um, structures and this physiology to be selective of the kind of bee because they will only want, basically if they are saying, if I only select one kind of bee, then maybe that bee will go to other kinds of flowers that are just like me. But bees kind of adapted as well. And so maybe they have special physical characteristics. Like maybe bees got, maybe bees got smaller 
to go inside those smaller corollas, you know, special behaviors, being active at certain times of year, being able to utilize certain rewards like oils, or maybe even being able to detoxify some of the poisons that the flowers are producing. Here's a, here's a great example of this. So Dianomia triangulifera, that's a type of sweat bee. I'm sorry, it doesn't really have a good common name. And then Helianthus annuus, that's a sunflower. So these, these bees and th this flower are kind of, they're really tightly linked. But this uh, sweat bee, it's only active for 24 days out of the entire year as an adult, and it produces less than six offspring per year. So it's not that many offspring, and it, it's not active that much, that much. So when it's alive, it really needs to make darn sure that it's alive at the same time that these flowers are blooming. So it forages in the morning during peak pollen presentation, and it nests in order to synchronize with the peak bloom of these sunflowers. So it, it, again, it's adapted these behaviors and this lifestyle to maximize when the flowers are around. Bees have special diets. And this, might, this is something that I think has been coming up, especially recently. I, I've noticed it's circulating around the internet that this notion that bees are picky eaters. And I do like this, you know, five, 10 years ago when I was learning about this, it was really, a lot of people were like, wait, what? Uh, but now I think people are starting to learn a little bit more about this, but I do want to talk about it, this concept of monolecti or an illegal lecti. So a monolectic bee is a bee that only forages on one species of flower. That's it. Without that flower, that bee will not survive. And without, you know, an illegal lectic bee is a bee that just forages on a handful of flowers. Maybe it's just one genus, or maybe it's one family of flowers, but it's a specialized diet. Like maybe it only forages on asters. You know, maybe, maybe that's all it forages on. It won't, it won't forage on, on a different kind of flower, like, like a willow or, or something. Um, and then a polylectic bee is a bee, like a honeybee, that can, will forage on basically just about anything. It'll forage on so many different kinds of flowers. And so uh, the monolectic bees are really, really rare. And so sometimes people get that a little confused. They think that bees are specialized. They're, if I don't have that flower, I'm not gonna have that bee. And that's actually a really rare condition. A lot of the specialist bees are what we call illegal lectic. And then a fewer group are called the polylectic bees. So here's a, a study that was taken in, in 2008, just kind of demonstrating the idea of illegal lecti. So this is a species of bee that only feed, it's, it's a specialist of asters, right? Asteraceae. And followed for 35 days over the course of its development, it had near 100% survival. So when the chemo survival is one, that, that's 100%. And you can see on different types of flowers, that survival was a little bit lower. And then it was fed this, this species of flower, Synapsis. This, the, it didn't even live for the 35 days. It, it died after 14 days. It just did not survive. And so that's, that's the concept of illegal lecti. It can feed on, it really likes the asters, can feed on a little bit more, but it's just not, it's still kind of picky and it will die if it doesn't have the right food sources. But what's kind of cool about this is that uh, it doesn't mean that you need to plant one type of flower for one type of bee and vice versa. Pollinators and plants work as what we call nested networks. So when you think about something like a Russian nesting doll, where it's one doll inside of another, inside of another, inside of another, that's kind of how these networks work. There are a bunch of interconnected things and some of the networks are smaller than others and they do connect with each other. So when you look at this guide diagram, this is what we call a highly nested community. And you can see the bees on the left, right? And the flowers on the bottom. And when the, the box is shaded, that means that bee will pollinate that flower. And you can see right here that this flower supports four different kinds of bees, right? And this bee will pollinate four different kinds of flowers. And so that's the kind of the ideal scenario on these, like, these nested networks is that you can plant one flower and it's gonna support a lot of different bees. And then one flower might only support three of them and then the blue flower only supports one kind of bee. This will be a less nested network. And you can see that, that it's not always a perfect match, right? That blue flower now supports two different kinds of bees. And then one bee doesn't pollinate all the, all the different flowers, but one bee is good. You know, that bottom bee is still really good at pollinating three different kinds of flowers. And so the real world scenario is, is closer to the left image, but it's not perfect like that. And so this was a study taken out of Penn State. And you can see that, that it's more or less a nested network where if you were to plant, for, for example, this species, and this was, a, this was on cultivars, if you would plant this cultivar 
you're going to hit a lot of different kinds of bees. You're going to get, a, you're going to get, you're going to be able to support a lot of bees. And so that's kind of the idea when you're, when you're thinking about planting a pollinator garden or planting for this year, you kind of want to hit those big, those big flowers, right? At least when you're starting, because that's going to offer the most bang for your buck. And so, and then this bee, if you see this bee, this is Bombus impatiens, common Eastern bumblebee, very, very common around here. I guarantee you have it in your yard if you have pretty much any flower. Um, this is going to support all these different flowers. So once you plant that blue fortune, you know, or whatever, that, 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 that good flower, you get your common Eastern bumblebees coming to your yard. And now you can start planting all these different flowers and they're going to be supported by this common Eastern bumblebee. And then you can start adding on from there. You can plant some of the more rare stuff. Maybe, and you can look over here. There's some of them, lazy glossum, right? This lazy glossum, um, we're Jerry. That one is, uh, that re really only goes for one kind of flower. And so maybe you would want to focus on that for the following year. But when you're just getting started, again, focus on kind of these big ones because they're going to offer the most bang for your buck. What's also good about this, and the reason why they think this evolved is because it makes the state, the structure more stable. It makes the, e the ecology more stable. So, you know, you know, as well as I do that bees don't always emerge at the same exact date every single year. Flowers don't always bloom at the same exact date every single year. And then sometimes flowers bloom a lot. Sometimes they don't bloom that much. You know, sometimes bees, there's boom and bust cycles when it comes to bees. And they think that this is a stable structure that will allow those communities to weather that storm. So for instance, like if this bomb is impatient, like let's say one year that that flower at the top is not blooming, now Bombus and Patience has other flowers to go to and vice versa. Like let's say Bombus and Patience isn't around, now that flower can be pollinated by a number of different bee, bee species. So again, just as a summary, nested networks are more stable. They're resilient to yearly and seasonal changes in both pollinator communities and flower communities. Um, so what about, what, what it, now we talked about stability, right? What's one of the things that's driving pollinator declines? Now we think that a lot of times this is a really hotly debated topic. We're not gonna get too into it because I could spend an entire, I can spend an entire evening talking about this. But we think that just as a general rule, urbanization is the primary driver of pollinator declines. Now that's gonna include everything from urban warming to pesticide use, to habitat fragmentation, to introduction of non-native species. It's just like a really, in my opinion, a lazy catch-all. It just kind of summarizes human interaction. That's basically what these researchers are saying. Human interaction is the primary driver of pollinator declines. Now, um, we find also that nestedness tends to decline with human land use too. So you may have a garden with many different bees, but that garden may not be well nested. I mean, you may not have a lot of overlap for, for, for different bees. You may have a flower and, and, and that's not nested. So again, a secondary goal of your gardens should always be to get that garden as nested as possible. Create a lot of fail safes within that garden. So even though you have bees going to one flower, plant another type of flower that supports that bee too, because that's gonna uh, act as a, a fallback plan for those bees. And it makes that, again, it makes that stable more structure, that structure more stable, where you have a community that is more resilient to yearly fluctuations. So again, promoting nestedness, really good thing. And again, that's, that tends to decline as, basically, as we start to lose species from an area, um, nestedness tends to decline. So again, kind of a, one of more, um, kind of like, I guess, uh, more concerning aspects of that is that we may not know a community is fragile and losing nestedness until bee species start to disappear. So again, that's kind of one of the things that came up to me as I was reading through that. But again, now let's talk about some like hopeful stuff, right? So what can you guys do as gardeners to support bees? Now I love this image because it kind of shows the idea that the American lawn is basically a desert to life. I give workshops on preventing tick bites. And one of the first things we talk about is Take your yard and turn it and basically have a well manicured American lawn because that is, again, it's a desert for ticks. Ticks can't really survive, but not a heck of a lot else can survive in, a, in the American lawn landscape. So the bees and the pollinators are really depending on what we add to that turf grass, right? So when the more flowering plants you can add to that turf grass, that's going to create this oasis in your garden. And a lot, of, a lot of bees, they can only fly about a quarter of a mile. So if you think about 
kind of as you're driving your car, right? Let's say you're, you're, you're running out of gas. You're dependent on there being another gas station within driving range to you. If, if that gas station is not, not there, you can't get to that point. And a lot of bees are kind of the same way. They need a lot of people creating a lot of gardens to connect the dots because certain bees won't be able to fly from one garden to the next. So let's talk about what, what to plant, right? So I, I do kind of shy away from using flower lists because what I like to talk about is, you know, different ideas and tips that you guys can use because the flower lists, they're imperfect, but if you have the right mindset, you're going to be better. Your, your brain is going to be better than a flower list. So you want to plant, um, some bees are only active for a few weeks um, and others feed throughout the growing season. So it's really important to have nectar and pollen throughout the year. Yards that seed diversity, again, might not be particularly robust. So you want to strengthen that network by adding more plants to your landscape. You want to try to plant native flowering plant, native plants. And maybe this has been hammered home to you already. But what we know, again, kind of going back to that, that, uh, that idea of these bees and these flowers evolving alongside each other. Um, and then, you know, one of the reasons why is, you know, non-native plants we find tend to compete with our native plants. And we find that pollination, it tends to be greater with these native species. And I, I want to talk a little bit about, about avoiding cultivars too. And this is, this is an analogy that really hits home to me. So as you're driving along Route 3, going back to Route 3, right? And you could, the exits, they used to be like this, right? They used to, they used to be like exit 14. And then all of a sudden, they, people wanted to change them. And now it's called exit 35. And that threw me for a loop, right? If you can imagine a cultivar being like this, right? Where the bee's going along and it has adapted for millions of years to what a flower looks like. And now you change one aspect of it. Maybe you make the, maybe you make the flower a little bit bigger or a little bit, a little bit different colored. Now that's going to change the way the bee perceives it. And if you're driving really fast and you don't see that exit sign, you may miss it. Right, you may, it may, might make you a little bit upset. Now let's say you go ahead and you change the color of that, right? Now that's gonna be even more confusing to that bee. And you change it to blue, and then maybe you change the shape of it. This is gonna all be, and now all of a sudden that doesn't even look like an exit sign. How's that bee gonna know to turn off on that exit, right? And so that's the idea of cultivars. You wanna avoid them. They're not imperfect all on their own. And some of them we find are even better than their, their, than their native variants. But in general, you don't know if what you're doing to that, that flower is this, right? You don't know if that bee is going to be super confused when it sees that flower. And you can see just kind of some examples of how we've changed flowers. They look so wildly different and they're pretty, right? But they, they may not be that great for bees. And we even find that some of the changes of, of uh, these bees are changes in scent. And if you remember, those flowers are gonna release that plume. As that bee kind of comes close, those electrical signals, that magnetic signals that the, the, the flower is giving off, that plume of scent is now going to be different to that bee coming across. So if you, you know, again, this hasn't really been studied in we just kind of discovered this. So it'd be interesting to see if that has an, an impact on pollination, but uh, it could, you know, I mean, Anytime you make a change, it could. So you kind of want to just tend to use these uh, kind of ideas as a guideline. And you can even build kind of your own flower lists right off that, right? And this is just an example I put together for a 4-H student. Um, I was like, she was like, what do you, what do you want for, a, what, how can I start a, a butterfly garden? And I was like, just plant stuff year round. And I gave her this an example. Like, I just threw this together all on my own. I took a bunch of stuff that I know is good at attracting pollinators, good nectar sources. And I combined that with, with plants that bloomed all year long. And this is gonna be a very, this is not gonna be a very nested network because there aren't that many flowering plants, but it's gonna attract a very diverse group of pollinators. Um, so over time, I'm gonna to wanna to add to this, right? Oh, I do wanna make a point about willow in this case. So I know oak has become uh, one of those things that a lot of people are talking about that's kind of been it's like the new hip plant that people are talking about supporting a bunch of wildlife. But actually willow we're learning is kind of critically important for pollinators. Uh, this study in last year, right? And it was done in the Pacific Northwest. So it could be a little bit different around here, but if this study really needs to be repeated in here because we don't know what's going on in New England, right? It would just, this study just came out in the Pacific Northwest uh, last year. And they found that in the spring, 57% of observed bees were found on willow. 
So if you don't have willow in your, you want willow right now. You want willow in your yard and you want that stuff blooming because that is, what we're learning is that is a very critical resource for some of these early spring flying pollinators and bees. So flower lists, then, you know, I do kind of, I, I want you to not use them if you don't have to, but if you do, they can be a good starting point. If you, number one, if you use the right one, and number two, if you just see it as a starting point, as a guide. So kind of, kind of like, again, kind of trashing these flower lists. Um, this is a study that was run on a comparison of some of these lists, some of them from major conservation organizations. They found that overall, they lack detail. They weren't really backed by science. So again, what this means is someone literally, if you look at, like, think about yourself, right? If you sat down and you were like, oh, I saw some bees on this, on this flower. You literally make, you can make a flowering list yourself and post that online, post it on Pinterest and get a million likes or, or whatever. That's, that's what they're saying. That's what these researchers are saying is that most of them are simply just one, an, you know, anecdotal experience, maybe just one person going out to their garden in a different state, maybe in a, you know, maybe in a like, completely different part of the country and just making a list. And that's literally all some of these flower lists are. They, a lot of them lack consistency. Some of them recommend poor plants and others omit good plants. And, and then one of the, one of the things I do want to bring about flower lists too is again, kind of hammering home that the fact that they're just a starting point is that this flower bellwort is never, ever, 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 ever on any flower list. It just isn't. I, I, I don't know why it just is never there. And this bee, Andrena uvularia, this is a, a monolectic bee. This bee, it only goes to bellwort, right? And so this bee, if this bee, if the, without bellwort, this bee is not going to exist. It's not going to survive, right? And so if you're planting strictly from a flower list and you never expand on that, you are not supporting this bee. And if you take, let, let's say you were going into your backyard and you dug up flowers and native plants around your backyard and you planted a flower list, you could have inadvertently gotten rid of this bellwort and then gotten rid of the bee, right? And you're, you're trying to support pollinators here, right? So it's really important that the flower, the flower lists are a guideline because there are many, 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 many bees that are not supported on flower lists. And, um, you know, kind of don't worry, I'll distribute these links. These are some examples of where you can get flower lists that are more or less trusted. Um, Xerces Society, I do, I do love them. I do, I do think they do great work. Native Plant Trust, again, they do great work. But I, I once sat down and I combined these two lists together into one, and I found they missed something like, um, I forget, I can't, I can't recall the number, but they missed a really sizable fraction of the number of specialist bees here in our state. They just didn't support them at all. Um, they were just completely neglected, even if you used, planted every single plant from both of those lists. Um, so again, starting points, right? And if you have a list, you always want to check it against um, Jared Fowler's uh, list of specialist bees, right? So you can go online, you can go to this website. Again, I'll distribute the link. Um, and you can see exactly how many bees your, your garden is supporting. You can actually look it up. You can say, oh, I'm growing this, I'm growing this, I'm growing. And you might not even be able to use this like a, like a check, like a check box. And there are too many flowers to plant in one garden. So, you know, don't get kind of hung up on it, but at least you can use this as like a, a good way of knowing what bees are being left out of your garden. So what about these bee hotels? Um, these bee hotels were, were kind of popular. I think they're kind of dying down nowadays as people realize this, but there's been a number of studies that have come out that show that they're not all that helpful. They're less like bee hotels and more like the Bates Motel where they're, they, they might actually be hurting bees and not really helping them. A lot of them have been shown to support maybe invasive species. Um, the way that they're arranged has shown to increase the risk of disease and parasitism. Um, if you're doing something like maybe running like a kid's workshop, or if you're, you know, if, if you like the look of them, I'm not gonna poo poo them like right to you. If you wanna use them again, this, this whole experience has to be fun and it has to be something you're gonna continue to do. What I would ask is that you replace the chambers frequently. So if you're gonna do them, again, they're not great. They're, they're not that good. But if you replace the chambers, like every every year, you're just replacing new chambers and you're, you're doing it, you know, and you're being very consistent about it, that can help mitigate the risk of disease and parasitism. And then that, that could, you know, 
that, that could be the better way of doing it, right? But again, like, right, these, these chambers, they only support, you know, 20%-ish of all the bees we have, right? So they're not great. And then they only support a minority of the bees. So they're just not, um, they're pretty. I mean, that's the best, that's really the best thing I can say about them. So what better, what can you do to support these bees in a better way? If you can tolerate this, just leave as many pithy stems and sticks around your yard as possible. What they, what the researchers found is that this three-dimensional structure about how, we don't like it, how it looks very disorderly, disorderly very chaotic. The bees actually like that. And um, they find that it's actually um, more beneficial at preventing things like disease and parasitism. Um, they also find that these natural plants may contain very important cues, like maybe the scent of them or their appearance can just be more attractive to these bees. So again, if you can tolerate this, this is the ideal. This is, the, this is what you want. This is doing it the right way. But remember, 80% of bees nest underground. And so what do you do to support them? How do you this is one of the things that is a head scratcher for a lot of us. How do you support 80% of ground nesting bees? Well, not a lot, unfortunately. It's one of those things that if these bees find you and if they're growing in your yard, count, count yourself lucky. I have, the, I have this going on in my backyard. I am so, so happy to have it. Um, these bees tend to like shady, well-drained soil near forest edges. But in terms of composition of sand, silt, and clay, it it, there isn't really any mix. Like, it's not like you could go to your backyard and just sprinkle down some mix and have bees come to you. That, that, that's not the way they work. It's like they select a habitat. And then once they select that, they love it and, they, and, and count, your, count your lucky stars, right? You know, count yourself among the lucky. And a lot of people, they get upset about this sometimes when they see it because some of these bees, they'll form like a string of holes. There might be 100 or 200 holes in a strip that runs all down their yard and they get so nervous about that. They, but if, if you're one of those people, what I'm here to say is the bees are not likely to sting you at all. I've gone basically face to face with one of these holes, never been stung. And um, they'll be gone within a couple of weeks. It's not like you're ever gonna need to um, get rid of them. They're, 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 they're gonna be done doing their job. They're gonna seal up those holes and those bees are gonna be nesting underground and living underground from that point forward. Um, but, and so that kind of summarizes, up, summarizes at least the good uh, tips and tricks, right? So plant flowers that are, you know, bloom all year long, try to create a, a well-nested garden with a lot of different flowers, a very stable structure. We, we talked about that. And use flower list as a guidance tool, right? But gardening is not black and white, and there's still a lot of research coming out, a lot of new stuff. And at this point in the topic, uh, I am going to kind of contradict some of the stuff I said, because some of the, the previous stuff, again, those are tips and tricks. Those are, some, those are guidelines, right? And those are something that we can use as a rule of thumb. But I do want to talk about this because I, I added this section because I had this, this conversation come up at one of the garden clubs that I was talking to and someone got really upset and they said that their neighbor chastised them for planting some non-native flowers and for planting some cultivars. They said, you need to dig those up. They're bad, they're not supporting. And they got really mad at them. But the, the thing is that gardening still has to be fun for you guys, right? It still has to be something you guys wanna do. Cause if, it, if, you're not, if, you're, if you're not gonna have fun and you're not gonna garden, you're not gonna wanna continue to do all this stuff. And um, so what, what is the deal, right? You know, so let's, let's dig into some of this nitty gritty behind these non-native plants in these cultivars. Cause I do wanna talk a little bit about this. And, if you, if you want kind of, uh, if you don't want to be confused, I guess just, just tune out for now. But if you want to know really what's going on with, with this, then, then, then this is where I'm going to talk about it. So these, these, these non-native plants, right, they can add diversity and it needs to be fun. And then some of the non-native plants are actually, they're beneficial in the way, in the sense that they don't really actively harm these bees. And then they do provide late season nectar resources for a lot of the bees. So they might not be the best pollen resources for some of these bees. Some of them might be, but some of them can just provide nectar and that can be enough of a kick to give these bees what they need, especially if it's during a drought or a dry time of the year and the bees are just running short on nectar. Having some of these non-natives that are well adapted to maybe drier conditions or hot, warmer temperatures can be beneficial. It can, it can help these pollinators, these, these pollinators, right? I really like the idea of Tartarian aster, right? That's a non-native late season bloomer. 
it blooms kind of late with our goldenrod and it can supplement the goldenrod in a landscape. So you never want these native plants to be the dominant flower that you're planting, but as a supplemental aspect to your gardening, something that is gonna pretty up your landscape, it can also provide some benefits to these, to these plant flowering plants. As long as you're not planting something that's invasive, for example, right? And when it comes to cultivars, the, the, the data are also very, very mixed. And this was a study done in 2021 where they looked at 25 different cultivars. And here's kind of what they found. They found that out of 106 bee species identified there, 86 of them visited cultivars. And so it's not like these cultivars are like, it's not like it's all or nothing, right? But they varied significantly, they did. Some of the cultivars were very, not very attractive at all. And some cultivars were actually more attractive than their natural counterparts. And so the reason we recommend avoiding cultivars is it's just to be on the safe side, right? We're gonna err on the side of caution. We don't know which cultivars are good. We don't know which ones are bad. If you avoid them, it's just to be safe. But again, if you wanna plant some cultivars just to kind of pretty up your landscape, um, as long as they're not the primary, uh, the focal point of your garden, not the, they're not the dominant species of your garden, the dominant, then, then I think that that's okay. You know, you shouldn't go across the street and chastise your neighbor about their cultivars. Um, they're okay, as long as your neighbor is supplementing everything else with native flowering plants. Uh, this was kind of a cool um, uh, discussion too, right? And so we're, we're learning more, even more now about flower arrangement. So this study was published last year in 2021. And what they found is that bees, depending on the bee, they, they will go to certain types of flower arrangements. And this was kind of cool. I, th I think I said that properly, right? So uh, if you're a big bee, like a bumblebee, those bees tended to visit dense patches of flowers. And if you're a small bee, like a small carpenter bee, those bees tended to visit more isolated patches of flowers. And this study just came out. So we don't know, like you could look around your garden and you could, you could even be planting a pollinator in a garden and wonder, how come I'm not getting that many bees? I planted all the right flowers. There's bees around me. Why aren't they coming? It could actually be the flower arrangement. And we're learning now, we, we still have no idea what the follow-up studies are gonna lead to or what they're gonna tell us. But again, they're one of the things where like, we're still, you know, all this new information is coming out and hopefully in the next few years, we're gonna learn maybe, maybe there's an optimal pattern that you can arrange flowers that will maximize the number of bee species you support. Maybe there is, we don't know that yet. We just know that that flower arrangement, it does impact the types of bees you see. And last, I want to leave, leave, uh, leave kind of with this, is that what we do here is going to be a team effort, right? Honeybees, bumblebees, they can fly for several miles. Most of your other species, a tenth of a mile to a, about a third of a mile, which means that if you are doing, again, if you're doing everything right, if your neighbor isn't, then you still may not see bees. So this is going to, it's going to be a group effort. It's, we're, going to have, we're going to play a game of connect the dots. And hopefully, if we all kind of do this together, we'll all support our, our native bees. Um, and with your help, we can prevent America's bees, so our native bees, from becoming America's lost bees. And I'd like to leave the, kind of a, a few different resources. Again, I'll, I have this in a handout, but these are some great books for looking up bees that are around your yard. This, bee, this book here, The Solitary Bees, Biology, Evolution, and Conservation, that book's a little dense, I'm not gonna lie. Um, that's less of an identification guide and more just for um, your own education. I really like that book. A lot of the information in this presentation came from that book. Very, very good book, um, solid. Um, it's just, it's a little bit dense to get through. And lastly, I'd like to uh, leave, kind of, kind of answer any questions that you guys might have on anything bee related, insect related. If you wanna talk about butterflies, you know, if you wanna talk about jumping worms, if you wanna talk about spotted lanternfly, ticks, mosquitoes, I, I'm here for you. Um, just let me know. Okay, we actually have a lot of questions. Uh, the first one is, can we get enough pollination, all that we need, with native bees without honeybees? No, um, we can't. Um, so, well, not in the way that things are structured as they are. So when you look at like large-scale agriculture, the, the, the native bees 
are they're, they're not enough. So there was one study that was, and so this kind of, again, is one of those things that gets confused when it gets spread around the internet. There was one study that was published that showed that all of the bee, all of the native bees in a landscape, they, they were equal to the number of bee, the number of honeybees that were pollinating a certain agricultural landscape. So if you think about it, right, could you then remove the honeybees from that landscape and still get that same number of pollination? I think maybe in that particular case, you can, but the way that the, the way that agriculture is structured these days is that honeybees get shipped around the country for pollinating giant monocrops, right? Giant large scale monocrops, right? And so if, on a farm, maybe on a, maybe a small scale farm, you might be able to get by with it. But if you're thinking about like a giant almond orchard or something like that, the, the, the fact that you can just get honeybees at a moment's notice to that almond orchard, and then maybe two or three weeks later to blueberry field, and then two or three weeks later, all the way to um, Massachusetts. Like these, I'm telling you, these bees get shipped around the country like all the time. Like, and so it's, it's that on-demand pollination service that I don't think is a replaceable thing. It's not that if you had the structure to support these native bees, I, I definitely think that that's possible, but that structure, at least in my opinion, is not in place quite yet. Quite yet. Okay, the next one is just a comment, which I thought I would read. It says, this is a fabulous talk. One of the best I have ever attended on bees. Great. Oh, great, thank you. Then the next question is, are you familiar with the work Purdue University is doing with breeding honeybees that will chew the legs off the mites that are attacking them? Oh, I'm not. That is fascinating. I, I love that. Um, that's really cool. I, I, you know, I did, I did, I'm very familiar with Varroa mite, um, but nothing, I, I know that, that some bees are being bred to be resistant to the, to the Varroa mites. That could be one of the behaviors that these resistant bees are developing. Uh, I wasn't aware of that. That's really cool. I like that. Thank you. Okay. The next question is, how is climate change affecting bees? That's really interesting. Good question. Uh, I'm not a climatologist, um, but what, here's what I will tell you is that the cues for the emer for flowers blooming and the cues for the emergence of bees are sometimes different. So some bees, some flowers, uh, some bees and flowers that will respond to environmental cues such as changes in daylight hours or temperature. And what, what, what can happen is this thing, it's a fancy term and I'm gonna throw it out there because then you can talk about it to your friends and online, it's called a phenological mismatch. And that's when a flowering plant will bloom maybe before, slightly before or slightly after the bee that's supposed to pollinate it emerges. And we have been seeing that happen in some cases where it's not complete. Like maybe the flower blooms like a, a day or, or not a day, but like a few days before the, it normally is supposed to. And the bees emerge like a few days after they're supposed to. And then you get that slight mismatch and there's a little bit less productivity. And so we, we, we've definitely been seeing that and we think that climate change is responsible for that. Okay, the next question is, where can we get the UPenn graph with different bees and different flowers? Oh, you like that? I can send that over to you. That's in, just in a study, a published study and I, I can definitely send that over to you. Okay, great. I can post it on the website. Um, the next question is, where can we find out the best native plants to support nest to support nestedness? So the the uh, the honestly, like a lot of like a, the flower list that I recommended from the Xerces and the Native Plant Trust are going to be a good starting point for them. Even though I was kind of poo-pooing them, right? Um, because they're they don't support all native bees, but they they have in them some flowering plants that are great bang for your buck. Like they're, if you plant just a cut, just that flowering list, you're gonna get a lot of different kinds of bees. And so that's gonna be a, a more nested structure. And then, we, then what I recommend is going off of those flowering lists and kind of going off on your own and looking at like maybe Jared Fowler's work and picking some of those plants off of that and su supplementing your garden, supplementing those flower lists with some of those plants. If that, I, I was trying to drive that home where you, you kind of take these lists that give you the most bang for your buck. They're, 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 they can have a more nested, they can give you a more nested garden. And then going off that and getting maybe some of these more specialized flowers and that support more specialized bees. And those are gonna be maybe a little bit more fragile, but hopefully some of those bees are gonna be supported by some of the other flowers you have growing there and vice versa. 
Okay, the next question. Can you discuss competition between honeybees and native bees and the implications for backyard beekeeping and for beekeeping on conservation lands? So uh, can you repeat, like, so um, can you discuss, okay, so honeybees are really, they're really kind of, a lot of times people are think like, so it's kind of tough with the honeybees, right? Is that they're, they're, it's not very clear cut, right? It's sometimes they're, they're, they're more, they're more like, I don't want to use the right, I don't want to use the term aggressive, but they're more dominating. They're, they're more dominating towards other native bees. And so we've been seeing some data where honeybees will like, they might, they might capitalize on some floral resources better than these native bees and kind of bully them out. In other studies, we've, we've seen um, that honeybees may have viruses or diseases that, so a flower, even though it's pretty and we put it up to our noses and we smell it, sometimes flowers have a lot of different diseases on them. And this might hit home because we're kind of living in the era of COVID, right? Imagine sitting at a restaurant table and something poops and eats at that table and then leaves it. And then you show up and you poop and eat at that table, right? And so that's kind of what the flowers are like. And so transmission of disease can definitely happen on, on flowering plants. And what we're seeing is that some of these bees are, are, are spreading these diseases to different native bees. And, and maybe the honeybees are resilient to them, but maybe some of these native bees are more affected by some of these diseases these honeybees are carrying. So um, we're seeing things like that. We're seeing, it's all kind of very new, um, new within the past decade, really. Uh, a lot of the research is kind of, really kind of taken off. It's not, I mean, there's some researchers that have been doing this for decades, but a lot of the, the kind of publicity behind it has kind of come up in the past, in the past decade and a lot of new, it's got, it made the research more robust and a lot more studies have come out on this in the past decade. And we're learning a lot more than we ever have on the, on the subject, but, and that's kind of the idea is that honeybees, um, the, it's, it's kind of this, a lot of people get in the mindset of, um, they want to look at the bad things that the honeybees are doing and they kind of focus on that. And there are some that they're finding that that's really kind of what is going on. The implications for backyard beekeeping, um, you can do it. Um, it's one of those things like, I, I don't really know. I can't, I'm not going to be able to sit here and tell you, oh, what you're doing is wrong or right. Um, I don't, you know, it's one of those things like you might have people say like, don't do it because there's a chance that it's affecting native bees and they're not wrong. There is a chance that the backyard beekeeping is affecting the native bees, but it's not like some, it's not like I can just go there and just say like, that it's clear cut wrong. Uh, we don't have enough data on that yet. Okay, the next question is, is it still helpful if we don't cut stems? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that, I think that if you can tolerate not cutting stems, definitely. Like I mentioned, the Osmium bees, they're, they should be active either now or in the next few weeks. And then they're going to like, a lot of times people want to know what time to cut the stems. And there is kind of sometimes where you have, when the bees, basically what you want is when the adult bees are kind of out and emerged, that's when you kind of want to cut them. And then hopefully there'll be more space, more stems that are new stems that the bees can then lay their eggs in and develop in and live in for the rest of the year. But there's never going to be a perfect moment when, none of the stems are gonna be used or there's gonna be just better times than others. So the less you can cut the stems, especially if you can tolerate in your backyard, then by all means, tolerate as, as much as you can tolerate, that's the number of stems you should leave. Okay. Can you create an area for ground nesting bees? Not really. Um, the bees like certain things and it's not like, they don't fly very far and they like certain things. And it's, again, this right composition of sand, silt, and clay, it's like a perfect mix. It's only gonna support some of them. And then again, they like sandy, well, you know, well-drained soil kind of near the forest edge. Um, there was a study that was published on, on, on bees, on communities, and they had this field and how these different species of bees. And then they, they demolished the field and then they replanted everything that they had grown that was in there before. And what they found is the communities, while pollinators came back, they weren't all the same, that that structure of those bees had changed. So it's, it's, it's gonna be, it's really tough. The ground nesting bees are kind of like one of those things that are very fragile. You really want to promote the idea that, that bees nest on the ground 
because if you or your neighbors ever see them, you don't want them to get rid of them. I, I saw a post on my, um, my town's Facebook page about someone who had these ground nesting bees and they wanted to know, and a lot of people were like, oh, get rid of them. They listed a bunch of the pest control services and things like that. And this is kind of what you want to tell people is, no, don't get rid of them because you have a special plot of land. You, that, that's kind of what you want. That's kind of the message that I want to get out to people is not necessarily cultivating these lands, but preventing the degradation of those lands. Okay. The next one says, I'm assuming using bark mulch in your flower garden isn't beneficial to ground digging bees. No. <laughs> would, chopped leaves, would chopped leaves be a better alternative? Um, you you kind of honestly, these ground nesting bees, they're not gonna like really much of much of any of those things that not I know we we it it, it still has to be fun. Gardening still has to be fun. So if you want to have bark mulch in, in your flower garden, that's okay. Some of these ground nesting bees aren't even gonna be like next to the flowers themselves. They might be further away from the flowers. And in that's so and that, you know, that's okay, right? Um so if you if you can again, it's um, what you can tolerate. If you can tolerate just having a sandy, dry pat, like where okay, where the bee, I have the ground nesting bees, where they are is in this patch of dirt that is in my backyard on this hill that looks awful. If someone came through my yard, it, I, I guarantee you they'd be like the property value of your home is like way worse because of this patch of dirt. But the ground nesting bees live there, right? And so. I can tolerate that, but a lot of, some people can't tolerate that in their turf. So it's as much as you can tolerate. If you can tolerate, if you want to use the bark mulch, it's, you're not active. I don't think you're actively hurting them because they, they weren't there to begin with. Um, and so you can use it if you want to stop using it and maybe the hopes of attracting bees, maybe, you know, here, here's a good, here's a good idea, right? And this is just a guess. Maybe, maybe have some areas of your yard that they kind of fit that bill and just watch them, see if the see if the ground nesting bees go there, right? And then you wouldn't need to worry so much about what necessarily is covering the, the bed of your garden because you know that the ground nesting bees are somewhere else. Um, I, if you want to use something, I would either go nothing or or go with what you want. That's that's kind of I know it's kind of long winded, but I would either go with the bark mulch or or do nothing at all. Okay, when is the best time to mow the grass? Morning or later in the day? I have lots of clover and many bees. Um, that's a really good question. Um, not, I don't really have an answer to that. I'm not sure. I know. Um, I would honestly say probably towards the end, the later part of the day, when the bees, uh, the bees, at least a lot of things are tend to be less active in the afternoons. But that's not 100. percent You know, some things are more active later on in the evening, and so you, you're gonna. If you mow the if you mow the lawn, something is going to be affected no matter what. Um, kind of on the subject of mowing mowing lawns, um, what they kind of find too is if you can get by with not mowing your lawn for several weeks, that's going to support that's going to be better at supporting supporting bees than mowing it say every week. So the, again, kind of I guess the answer to the question is the less you can mow it, the better. And if you have to mow it, maybe try to hedge it towards the afternoon hours. Um, if you have to, but this, something's still going to be affected regardless. Okay. How late should dandelions be left before mowing grass? And regarding dandelions, there are other flowering bushes and willow trees in the area. That's good. Um, that's good about the dandelions. Um, the thing about dandelions is that they're, they're not, they're not like the best plant for support. I know a lot of people really like them. Same thing with kind of clover, but the dandelions and the clovers are not native flowering plants. And so you, you want to supplement though, you, I would, I would recommend supplementing those. Like you said, you have willow around them. That that's a great thing. Try supplementing those with, um, other kinds of early, early flowering, early spring flowering plants that are native. It's going to be better at supporting, again, this is kind of going along the topic of having a nested, nested structure. You've got your dandelions, you've got your clover, and now you're adding on even more to support those early spring flowering bees or early spring flying bees. And that's going to create a more stable structure where if you were to mow and get rid of those dandelions and clover, now those bees have something else to go to. Okay, we have another comment. Excellent presentation. One of the most down to earth and informative on the topic that I've heard. Many thanks. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the comment. And then the next question is, can you define nestedness? 
So this, again, it's like kind of a, a complicated subject and I'm gonna try, um, I'm gonna try to ex explain it maybe in a, a different way. So the idea is like, let's say you have, um, let's say you're, you're building up a pyramid, right? And you have, you want, you have, you might have some flowers that might act as support structures supporting that pyramid, right? Where they support many, many tiers of that pyramid. So in this analogy, they're supporting a large number of bees. So the idea that one flower that you plant can support many, many different species of bees, right? And so that's kind of like the outside of that nest, right? The, the, the nested structure, right? And then inside you might have another flower that will support that will support maybe 80% of the bees that the prior flower supported. So they can still support a lot of bees, but not as many. And then another flower would support maybe 30% of the bees that the two preceding flowers would support. And then that, so that's what you have going on in the flower side, right? And then going on off, on the bee side, one bee might pollinate, you know, most of the most, you know, all the plant that you have there. And then the next bee would pollinate maybe 80% of the flowers you have planted. And then the last bee would pollinate maybe 30% of the bees. So it kind of is like this descending thing. So if you were to lose out on one of those bees or one of those flowers, that maybe that whole pyramid would stay standing because you have so many different connected interactions that are support all holding each other together. The idea of something that's not nested would be something like you have one flower that only supports one bee and one bee that only pollinates one flower. So if you were to lose that flower, then that bee goes away. Vice versa, if you lost that bee, the flower would go away. And so that would be something that would be like not nested, right? So it basically just means that there are many different interactions and that the whole system is kind of connected. I do like to talk about it because it's the, I, a lot of times people um, don't understand and they kind of get the idea that if they don't have a flowering plant, then they, they, they look at gardens like a cookbook where they, they're like, if I add this flower, I'm going to get this bee. Or if I add the, you know, if I have this bee, I'm going to get this flower. But it doesn't really work like that. It's more about planting um, flowers that are really good pollinated, good, good at attracting bees, and then supplementing that with things that overlap with, with those types of flowers. And so you want, oh, you want a community where there's a lot of different overlap bees that can go to not just one flower, but two or three different flowers and flowers that can be pollinated not by one bee, but many different bees. Okay, the next question is, I want to attract more hummingbirds, but when I put feeders out and get more bees and very few hummingbirds, is there any way to satisfy the bees so I'll get more hummingbirds at the feeders? I, I don't know. Um, that's a really good question. Uh, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I, I guess like, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm sorry. I'm not really, a, I don't really understand the dynamic between honey, hummingbirds and bees. So it's not something that I feel confident in answering. Um, you could, I mean, I kind of wish you a lot of luck with that. Maybe there's, maybe there's a, I, I think there's a birding presentation coming up soon. And maybe, maybe, um, maybe the birder might be able to help you with that. Okay, the next question is, is there anything to plant that will deter ticks? Not legally. <laughs> so there's, um, there's a, lot, a lot of people think about planting. Um, so a lot of people think about planting certain types of plants and they think that like the smell of the plant is gonna deter ticks. There's, there's nothing in that you can, there's, a, there's nothing you can really, there's no native plants or there's nothing you can really do to deter ticks that way. If you have a, you know, your the American lawn, right? The, the Kentucky bluegrass. If you have that turf grass growing in your yard, if you have just turf grass, there's not really gonna be any ticks that there's gonna be very, very few ticks living on that turf grass. So that's something you can plant that's legal that, that, that would kind of make it so like, you're not, I mean, you can roll around the grass and you're not really gonna find ticks. Um, if, if, but most people, when they ask that question, they're talking about maybe if I can plant like a flowering plant and that's good, or like um, a type of plant that has oils in it that will deter the ticks. There are some essential oils that have been shown to deter ticks, things like rosemary and wintergreen, but those deterrents tend to be uh, only serve as repellents when the leaves are crushed. And they, they've even kind of shown this with mosquitoes. And 
they, they're, they, most of this data comes out of studies that are done in Africa. And that's why I mean not legally is that they've shown certain plants in Africa that can deter things like mosquitoes and ticks if their leaves are crushed. And what they'll do is they'll, they'll go to like certain villages or maybe a house that doesn't have windows or screens. And they'll hang up these plants that these people are growing. And right before they go to bed or like during twilight hours, they'll, have, they'll recommend that the people crush all those leaves to basically create a repellent around their house. Um, and that, that can be doable, but not something that you could just grow in your garden. There's nothing that you could just grow in your garden and just be like set and forget that it's just gonna repel ticks all on its own. There's no, there are no plants that will do that. Okay, that looks like the end of the questions. We do have a couple comments that I'd like to read. This has been the most informative presentation on bees I've ever seen. Your enthusiasm awesome. and love of bees shines through and I really appreciate it. I've learned so much, thank you. And then Thank the last so one, uh, the person said, enjoy this lecture. Wonderful speaker, learned a lot. I'm afraid of wasps, but now I feel like they're just doing their job <laughs> and I'm more relaxed for the coming gardening season after listening. Thanks. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm really glad that you guys enjoyed it. You know, if you like it, you know, just feel free to give me a shout out. I, I, I love teaching people and I'm always happy to give more presentations in the future. All right. Thank you so much, Blake. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Lori. Have a great yeah. night. You too. Bye-bye.